Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I just want to say what a fantastic venue we've got here today. I think uh, you've done as proud, Liz, for this, this uh, fantastic theatre. I'm here today to talk to you about Kobe. But first of all, um, introductions. As Liz said, my name is uh, Anthony Walsh. I work in the Cardiff office of, of Stride Trigglow, and I'm a chartered technologist by, by qualification. Um, I'm also a senior associate uh, in the business. And I'm actually the sector lead for public and community, which is prisons, courts, uh, police stations, things like that, general public buildings. Um, I've been with the business 12 years and come a long way in various sectors within the business. I'm joined today by my colleague Dean Hunt, who's been the project um, BIM manager for the, this project we're talking about today. He has a wealth of knowledge in the BIM industry. It's his second tenure with, with Stride Triglown, and uh, we're very lucky to have him as, as part of our team. Right, so what is Kobe? Well, about this time two years ago, I had a phone call from my director to say, I want you to work on a project and you're going to be working with Kobe. I didn't know what Kobe was, so I looked it up on the internet. That's what I found. And I thought, happy days, my life's going to get interesting from now. <laughs> However, that's Kobe Smulders. She's probably some of you amongst us will know who she is. She's best known for playing that character in How I Met Your Mother. On, on American uh, comedy soap. I quickly found out that actually that wasn't what I was going to be working with, unfortunately, and then I dropped down to the real world. So what actually is Kobe and what does it stand for? Very simply, construction, operations, building, information exchange. So basically the various stages of what we do, the design, the implementation, the operation and the asset management of a building all goes into a, for, a pro forma that can be simply manipulated and read. So what actually is Kobe? Well, there are some various uh, definitions out there on the internet, and Kobe is a formal schema that helps you organize information about new and existing facilities. That's exactly what it does. It is general enough that it can be used to document buildings, infrastructures, and various types of construction projects. Um, it's also simple enough that it can be transmitted using a spreadsheet. Excel, Microsoft Excel, lowest common denominator. Most people can use Excel, and that's really what it's about. So, when is Kobe going to be implemented? Does anybody know? Probably. So the answer in the government mandate is, from 2016, any firm who want to be working with government projects will be required to deliver data-rich models, drawings, and asset information in an open digital format called Kobe. And that's effectively what the government are mandating, similar to soft landings and various other things that they're looking at as various uh, early learning um, projects. This is an extract from uh, the government strategy, exactly what it says on the tin. Collaborative 3D BIM with all project and asset information, so that's your asset information model, documentation and data being electronic. And by two th 2016, a stage plan will be published with mandated milestones showing measurable progress at the end of each year. So what actually that means, don't know. But the government are at least putting it out there into the, into the field about what they're trying to do, which is obviously going to drive our industry forward. So where did it come from? Kobe, as probably many of you know, was actually something that was derived by a gentleman called Bill East from the US Engineering Corps and, and by NASA, and it's endorsed, endorsed by NIBS, which is the National Institute of Building Sciences. It can deliver very simple things, equipment lists, product data information, warranty information, maintenance information, how often and how soon you need to maintain a particular piece of equipment. And it's easy to understand, as I said before, it's basically an Excel spreadsheet. That's all it is. <clears throat> and this slide here demonstrates the sort of information that uh, the Kobe or, or, or BIM actually, level two BIM allows you to produce. So on the left, you're looking at a 3D model. This happens to be an infrastructure project a road cutting somewhere, but it's showing you that out of the on the top right there you're getting a, a 2D cutaway drawing that we're all used to producing, and then on the bottom there, a, 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 an extract from a Kobe spreadsheet which gives you the, the, the basic principles of what um, the, the Kobe spreadsheet looks like. As I said, we have questions on the way. You, you can do if you... No, the, three, the 3D model is produced first, obviously, then you, your 2D drawings. 
and then you need to populate, which is something we'll come on later, later to, exactly, with whatever software you're using, you can populate the model with the asset information or whatever you need to, you need to put in. But as, as this says, um, you look at that slide there, again, it's, it's, this is a lot of information from the government websites. As you design a building, you can apply the asset information. As you build the building, you add more weight to it. And as you operate the building, you become more familiar with it. So basically, the approach is to enter the data as it is created. You need to know at the very beginning of a project what the requirements are, what the expectations are at the end, because without that, you're on a hiding to nothing. So as long as you have that information, you can react to it. There's nothing worse than trying to react after the event, you know, once the stable door is bolted, because you're, you're always playing catch up. So you need to know very early on with all these initiatives, actually what it is that you're being asked and mandated to provide at the end. Contractors, well, designers provide the basic information. So we, as an architect, we provide a, a native model. Uh, we happen to use Revit as our uh, software choice. We produce a simple model. We provide it to the likes of our colleagues who work with us on this project, engineers and M&E uh, contractors who design their bits. But we, we assign uh, various things like the floor level, the space or the room name, uh, and the equipment layout. So, you know, how the, how the desking is arranged and how the equipment is arranged in the room. And that's basically a very simple model that we produce that gets bolted on as the design progresses. When you move later on into Kobe, contractors provide uh, the, the, the operating information. So, for example, the make of the boiler, the model, um, the serial number of the equipment, and much more of the data that goes into the FM, which is used at the end of the project by the facilities manager, to ob obviously run buildings such as this, for example, who, uh, you know, producing a Kobe on this building would, would be wonderful, I'm sure, but um, it, it would be very difficult to start uh, right now. So, Kobe really has two main purposes. Number one, as a data exchange format. So data ex exchange is achieved by extracting information from a native BIM model of choice, doesn't have to be Revit, that just chooses to be ours, or an IFC, Industry Foundation Class file, um, and placing that into a, into a standard Kobe schema ready for import into other products, CAFM projects, projects such as facilities management applications. The second point of Kobe is as a check-in tool. So as you enter the data in, Whatever that data is, you obviously need to understand that. It, it can be used as a way to validate the asset information that you're putting in to make sure, for example, that you're at the right stage for a drop two, which is just about to go to tender. So you've got enough information for that building and that facility that, that you can go out to that particular stage of the project. So under Kobe, there are various different interpretations and um, Dean will no doubt uh, talk to you about um, PASS 1192 or the BS. But there are effectively um, five drops, drop stages, which relate to the old RIBA stages of work or the new seven stages uh, uh, as we now know them. But effectively, drop one uh, is a requirement to constraint on a massing model. So it's basically your early stage concept. Nothing more, nothing sophisticated, no real data necessarily involved. Drop two is an outline. So effectively, that's your old RIBA stage C which is kind of your planning permission, so you know really what the building's gonna look like, how it's gonna function, what's gonna go in it, roughly how big it is, so you've got sort of that level of information. And then drop three is where you're at the construction stage, you're about to go, or you, you probably, by this time you've reached tender, so you know how big a boiler is and what steel's in the building, what ff and E's in the building, what the wall makeups are, everything about that building you kind of know but you don't necessarily know the manufacturers or, or anything like that. You just know that it's a boiler. So you've got a generic piece of equipment or something that's modeled roughly to the size and shape that you think it's going to be. When experts in the room can obviously bring their individual discipline experiences and, and knowledge to that, to that uh, 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 stage of the project. And then drop four, that's where you move into the contractor um, led bias where you're looking for operations and maintenance it says on the slide there so you're looking for for example serial numbers maintenance arrangements make and models of things so you know that it's a wash the bosch boiler and you know that it needs to be serviced annually and it tells you all of that information in the o ms and we can link that through what we've done on this particular project to uh, various electronic softwares but more importantly in the native model so that by clicking the mouse you can click to various stages of the electronic O&M, so rather than hand over reams of paper that we've all become used to, 
it's in the COBE spreadsheet, but more importantly, it's also in the model for, for people in the room who can use it, FM managers who will be able to use it in the future. Don't think they're there yet. Um, and when you talk to certain FM managers about using native models, they run a mile because that's not what they're used to. They like their big paper folders. They know they can go and look at it, take a page and go and wave it to somebody and say, I want that fixing, please. And then obviously drop five, which is kind of after um, construction, so it's after handover, it's the operating and operation and maintenance post-occupancy where the FM facilitator needs to be, and I'm not sure how this will work, but responsible for updating the information. If something gets changed, obviously pushing it back into the Kobe spreadsheet, important, but more importantly into the model, if there's obviously an electronic model. Don't quite know how that's going to happen. That's something that I think that moving forward post-2016, you know, we might get better ideas. At the moment, we're on very early stepping stones approaches. Um, we've delivered uh, a drop four, so we know what's expected to these levels, but that's through designers, subcontractors, and main contractor level. I think after the event, we've got a lot to learn and a long way to go, and we need to establish protocols and, and discussions with some of these FM providers in order to do that. Drop two, um, well drop two is like an out outline solution, so you're basically looking at sort of stage sort of B almost, where you know you want a building, you know for example that it's a school, you know roughly how, how, many, classrooms, sorry, how many classrooms it's got, uh, how many pupils you're catering for, what facilities you need, so you de you're designing a, more than just a sketch outline, a building that's got most of the environments and the, and the qualities that that building needs. So it's, it doesn't have the detail necessarily, sorry? Yeah, it's basically design data. So you know you've got 30 classrooms and they have to cater for 30 people each. So you know the size of spaces you're going to create when you design the building and whatever that might be. Well, as it's interesting. Um, 2A, uh, yes. I mean, 2, 2A and 2B, there are, there are uh, various stages of... Uh, that, that level two and there's various debate about what information needs to go into them. Dean and I have conversations, we, we talk, I talk about five drops because that's kind of what the government mandate is. Under the British standard I think there are how many? Seven? But some, some of them don't actually get published outward, they're more for internal communication. So a 2A for example could be for internal review and then your 2B goes out for, for that particular purpose which might be for example, tender or, 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 or something like that. Are you expecting to hear from the FM people about doing the drop five? Or those from those to, to be honest, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I mean, we've engaged with FM contractors and we've had a very good dialogue with the, the, the people who are our employer on the project about what they foresee and they have various <laughs> views about what they think they want to get. Some of them don't even think it's this, but there you go. Um, other people are totally embracing it and they're all up for it and they're engaging the likes of you know, software suppliers who are designing and be able to read and inter interrogate the, the Kobe data and actually asking questions about actually that column there is probably a bit superfluous to our needs but we totally understand that. Well, exactly, and that's where, that's where I, I said we need to, need to understand what's going to happen in the future, because I've talked to people about, wouldn't it be great if you didn't have your big A3 or A4 folders, you had an electronic model that sat on a computer that you could go click the toilet pan, for example, and it tells you there's an armature shanks contour 21 base, uh, pan, and you can go and order one rather than going to have to find it in one folder on 17 volumes of, of lever arch files. But... That's not where we're at at the moment. I think FM managers are not even necessary. Some, some establishments, some, some properties don't even have FM skill people. They are caretakers and janitors. I mean, I manage the building in our office. I'm not FM. However, I know exactly how to manipulate what I need to find. So if I need to change something, I can click it. But that's me. Uh, you know, uh, ma Massive, massive. However, we are very early doors at the moment of producing this. 2016 is not far away, so what was it, 18 months just over, and we're probably able to produce drop three as, a, as an industry. I think there's a big knowledge gap at the moment with the supply chain. We've experienced it. We, we engaged with what we thought was a proactive supply chain. 
who all said, yes, we will come along for the ride, but they didn't have the first clue about the level of information or the expectancy of the information they needed to provide. And we ended up having to take some of that information and actually populated it, which, which is what Dean, Dean will show you, populated it back into the model front end so it actually could be read out into the spreadsheet back end. So at the moment, as I say, I think, I think once with, with people, I don't know what the level of, of um, representation we have here, but if we've got architects, engineers, mechanical, electrical, people like that, drop one, two, and three are kind of where we're able to input. Once you get into four, you're into supply, you're into the contractor, you're into the supply chain, and there's probably, there are companies out there who are producing information. There are some very good information, there's some ropey information, it's just what you do with it. It's how you interrogate it. And drop five, don't think anybody's there yet, but there's probably people hopefully looking at it and thinking, hmm, that's what, what we, can, uh, we, can, we can serve to, to look forward to. Well, inf interesting. IFC, um, they, one, one of the things that um, I'm able to suggest is w when we undertook this particular project, we all sat in a room and we all agreed that we were all going to use Revit. Um, the contractor, the architect, the engineers. However, that's fine in the design team. And we all got to a level, sort of drop two, into drop three using Revit. However, when you go out into fabrication, Structural engineering moves, for example, from you know, your, your designer into Tecla, and um, you know, you've got precast concrete, they're using different design softwares. There's a lot, lot, lots of different softwares, all of which can do it. Our experience is, and, and people like the Ministry of Justice and government sectors are remaining where they say software agnostic as best they can. However, you know, you've got to look at, and I think personally, I'm not saying necessarily Revit is the best software, it's our chosen piece of software, but I do think that if you can establish the, the, the goalposts early doors as to what you want to use and what your outcomes are going to be, it's going to be much easier than experiencing it like we did when we tried to export data out of a, out of a Tecla model, which had all the geometric coordination in there, had all the data information in there, but it just wouldn't talk. And that was a big problem for us. And... Um, we then introduced, um, some of you might be um, aware of a piece of software called Celebri. Celebri, um, whilst I'm not here to sell that product, um, is probably one of the best pieces of software for extract, for reading IFC. Um, so whether you get your IFC from Revit or you get it from Tecla or any other piece of native software that remains you know, open to be to, for choice, IFC at the moment needs to be developed by the industry, whoever needs to do that, to make it more stable, that it can talk amongst the various pieces of software. At the moment, it kind of does, but there are things that fall off. And it's difficult to explain, actually, but as I say, when you, you, you put the Tecla model in, it loses some of the data that you've worked hard to put in in your earlier drops, and that was a problem we experienced through this. So this is um, what a Kobe spreadsheet looks like. Um, as I say, on first view, Kobe looks like a spreadsheet from hell. And when you first look at it, it's a big step back and a big inhale of breath. Multiple tabs, thousands of rows, gaudy colours and some meaningless codes, some of which you, you don't need to understand. But when you look at it in closer inspection, there's a very simple methodology to it. So yellow, see the yellow columns there, those are required fields. So those are bits of information that you need to populate. Green are optional fields, so therefore you have the choice should you want to uh, populate those columns. Orange is reference of something else that lives already, so a previous completed tab in the spreadsheet, or a pick list. Now on the Kobe 2.4 spread uh, pick list uh, template that we used, at the end of it there is, is a, a tab that, that actually has all of the pick lists, so it defines the facility, defines various things, the uni classes that we refer to. So those come from the orange and then the purple colour, um, external reference. For example, it tells you that this it's an Autodesk Revit 2013 IFC file. So those things, those are basically, basically what comes out of. So the purple automatically generates. Orange is relatively easy because you're just pointing at something else. And then you have to, you have to manipulate the, the, the other two should you choose to. So what actually is in the... Um, 
the, the Kobe spreadsheet. So it's broken down into, into a, a multiple categories. In fact, there are 20 different tabs on a Kobe spreadsheet, some of which you've got facility or building. So for example, it's a, it's a school. Um, the floor, so it's the ground floor, or it's a mezzanine, or it's a first. The zone or department, so you might have a hospital, for example, where you've got accident emergency, or you've got your, your x-ray departments, or things like that. And then down to rooms, um, which are obviously self-explanatory. Then it's got the types of, facility, of, of, um, of objects and components and systems. Now, systems is an interesting one, and, and assemblies, which Dean will give you some insight on when we come to that. But as I say, there are 20 different tabs, and, and they all look something like that. So there's a lot of information you have to put in front end, and populating that manually, I think, would be an absolute nightmare. Um, we found ways of doing it automatically, or semi-automatically, um, using skills of, of, of Dean and various pieces of software like Salubri, and that's obviously taken a lot of the pain out of what could be a massive task for all of us. <laughs> I don't know about Revit, but what we'll talk about in, in Dean's part of the, of the presentation is, is kind of what we did to bridge the gap and how we did it. So I'll, I'll defer that question, if I may, to when, when Dean talks, and um, hopefully that will answer it. And if not, we can talk afterwards about, about you know, what you need to do. Um, as I said, because you've got areas that you need to populate, there will be some area of manual population, so you have to fill in certain parts of it, not a lot of it, and hopefully the majority of a Kobe spreadsheet would be automated. Um, the data has to be added back into the IFC, and that's what we said earlier to answer your question about the model. Ultimately, when you hand over a Kobe spreadsheet, an IFC model really should go with it and possibly a native file, whether that's a Revit file or whether that's a Salibri file or a Navisworks file that has all of the, the federated inf information back into it. Otherwise, as you say, you'd have to be man added manually into, into the spreadsheet. And we, we think, we don't see, the, reason, we don't see the, the logic in actually handing over a populated Kobe spreadsheet to manually and then not have relevance to the electronic data. That, that you've produced it out of. It, it doesn't make sense to us. However, we're not driving that way forward. And then maintaining automated population alongside, man, alongside manual throughout the phases requires a defined process to limit the amount of manual aspect of data input. Now, nobody wants to do that. If you look back at that slide, if you had to fill that in longhand, it's prone to error. I'm sure you know, it's gonna go wrong, and I'm sure your people are gonna lose the will to live by populating that, and at least understanding how softwares go it's reading the various things. As long as you put the, the parameters right, it'll all fill in for you to a point. Now, while there is momentum to get the industry to, to deliver BIM data, I'm not fully convinced at the moment, and maybe it goes towards answering your question, that many organizations have a plan of what they're actually going to do with the information. Now, you talk to FM providers and they say, thanks for that, but I want row one, row five, and row seven of that data sheet, and that's all I'm going to use. Well, fine. If that's what you want, then that's what we've given you. Kobe is a way of identifying the level of information that they need, and they need to establish it early doors to be able to say, actually, different people will have different requirements. And when you talk to various people who say, we've heard about Kobe, we don't actually want Kobe, when you actually talk to them and you have a conversation, you actually realize that without knowing it, they do. And it's interesting how we, we've talked to a number of people like that. So basically, the way things are at the moment, people will go from receiving 2D drawings and documentation to basically receiving drawings, the same, native models, and Kobe files. And they're not really necessarily geared up at this moment in time to manage any of that data that they get. They only want a certain level of asset management that they understand today that they can carry on using and they can react to it. So we need to, we need to make the data intelligent and easy to use, and that's where we've talked to, ver to various people to say, actually, we can actually help you along this path and we can give you certain levels of training and expertise of how to use the model and how to, how to navigate it to a level. I'm not going to make them sort of Revit technicians overnight, but at least they'll have a way of driving it. And our main contractor that we worked with had no experience of using 3D modeling. They installed Navis Works in their site offices. And by the end of the project, they were running Navis workshops, 
uh, toolbox talk, so every contractor was coming to site and they were given a whiz around the model to see what it is that they were building. And that was run by the project manager on site who, who didn't know what a 3D model was before that, which was actually quite encouraging. But as I said earlier, I think there's a desperate need for computer-aided facilities management or CAFM developers to actually get involved in the process now. At the moment, we're working with the government departments to produce the spreadsheets that you're seeing without really understanding what people are going to be using it for at the real coalface and the building side of things. Now, people will tell you they're going to be using it. And I think in 2016, when people actually, re after a few more of these example of projects have happened, when there's a few more under the belt, people will actually know what the information actually really, really means. Currently, there's probably a handful of companies who are really embracing it, but that's going to grow with, that, with our experience and your experience in how, in how we can all understand to better implement that. Right, so that's basically a, an introduction into what COBE is. Now's the time to hand over to my colleague Dean and uh, with Steve there to hand over the mic. But as I say, Dean has come to us with a wealth of knowledge, uh, knowledge and experience from working on a fairly large project, which he'll tell you about briefly. Um, we can ask questions at the end, or if there's anything you want to ask now, then happy to uh, try and answer. Okay, thank you all for coming. Um, Anthony's introduced me briefly, but I'm just going to talk about myself just a little bit more <laughs> as to why I'm here. So I've got 15 years in the construction industry. I'm a qualified actual te technician. I've got seven years experience using Autodesk Revit, four years experience in utilizing BIM, three years to BIM level two and beyond. And my career highlight so far is working uh, three years in Australia as BIM coordinator. What was I doing over there, apart from sunbathing? Um, I was working on the new Royal Adelaide Hospital, delivering a BIM level three project, and that was a $2.2 billion project. And there's just a picture in the, the background of what it looks like there. So Anthony has taught you at great length <laughs> about what Kobe is. Um, hopefully none of you have been at presentation like this before because I'm going to actually show you how to do a Kobe. So you all know what it is, but how do you actually deliver it? Um, I'm sure we're all looking like this when uh, we're trying to deliver a Kobe project in a minute. That's a slightly big process. It is. Um, so this plenty of different ways you could you can probably do this um, and we're all obviously using different pieces of software um, we're only going to talk today about the, the software we've actually used um, and we've chosen those those along there so we've got the CAD technology sent the Kobe plugin for Revit um, we've got Revit architecture Celebi model checker and of course Excel which is the final output uh, that we're required to, to produce also we've used Autodesk design review um, this was not used in-house by us, but we've used it for suppliers and manufacturers information. Um, so they need to use this piece of software just to look at the model, find elements, and report back to us um, the, the data that's required. Um, very good piece of software and something that's often overlooked and, and underrated. So where do you start? We've got a model, and we've built it in the Autodesk Revit software environment. And this is the project we've worked on quite a small project, um, it's 5 million bill cost, um, most of that was just M&E and FF and &E, to be fair, but it was a good start for us just to use Kobe output on and, and you'll soon see the amount of data that's produced out of the model which is so small, I know we've got people in the room today who've also worked on this project as well so they'll recognise that. So what do we have to do first? First thing we have to do is we have to populate the model that we've just seen with Kobe parameters. How do we do that? Well, we use the CTC plugin for Revit, um, which is what you can see here. And we just literally use this to create the parameters, which then gives every single element within the Revit environment all these different types of parameters you can see. There's a lot of them. That's just in the type properties. And then there's also the instance properties as well, which are created, and you get all these generated by that plugin. Back to the plugin again, and then we can then populate that plugin with the data which is going to need to be attached to every item. So that's going to be things like when the item was created, the category, its unique identifier, um, and your email address for contact once all the data is in the Kobe spreadsheet. So all you have to do is literally let that do its work, and then you get the parameters populated in the remote environment. 
under the type and the instance properties as well. So you can see all those are then populated using that plugin. <coughs> type, uh, every element in Revit has got type and instance parameters. So a type parameter applies to every element with the same parameter. An instance is just on an instance based. So it would be individual to that object every single time. Um, first thing to do then is um, go to the project information tab. We've all seen the project information tab in, in Revit. And with the Kobe plugin, it populates lots more parameters than you're usually used to seeing. And you literally have to fill out all the basic parameters that you would do on a daily basis anyway, which is just uh, you know, um, your addresses, um, what the project is, <coughs> what your discipline is. So at the bottom there, we've got the code for architects, which is new class code. Um, and that is just a one-off population in the model. You never have to touch it again. And that will ultimately populate the contact and facilities tabs in the Kobe output. Next, we come on to the classification. Classification of items in Kobe is pretty much what it's all about. Um, and what do we need to classify? So we need to classify rooms and spaces. Anthony's talked about this briefly. We need to classify the zones, systems, and elements. How do we go about doing that? Well, we, we, in some instances, we're given um, pick lists from Kobe, which we've been, spoke about briefly. And these are some of the pick lists for the spaces and zones. So we've got uniclass codes there for spaces and zones, and we have to use those. We're, we're governed by the, the Kobe spreadsheet, and it has to be one of those. And so have got a few videos in here now, so we'll just go through some of these and show you how we've actually done it. So all we've done is we've built those uniclass codes into Revit, which gives us this pull-down list. So every single space within our project, we've gone down, we've actually classified that space to what it is. And we have to do that for each, for each space. So it's, Kobe is a good thing to, to be doing at the outset. So as we're building the model, as we're going along, we, we add all these parameters to the model as we go. And we can do this kind of thing at the end, but to be honest with you, it's just much easier if you do it as you go along. And you, at the end of the, pro the project, you've got all the data you need. You have chosen each of those classifications as part of the model of the project zone. Sorry? You have chosen each classification, each, each heading classification as part of the project zone. Those classifications are all uniclass codes. So, so there's a uniclass table for spaces. There's one for zones. There's one for elements. There's one for systems. So the Kobe pick list at the end has a, a list of each of those classifications, and those are the classifications you have to use. But you, you don't need uh, each class, every classification for a specific project. You, you still have to put your name. Um, yeah, from, from the pick list, you can, you can select the individual instances that are related to the project. A list exists, yes, but you might only want three or four. Exactly. Yes. You might only want three or four, but... But for the template, we've actually built all of the parameters into the template, so we've got all of them. We didn't want to try and be in a situation where we've got to create a new template for every project, so that has got every single code in it. Um, depending on how big the table is, thankfully the zones and spaces table isn't that large, so Revit can, can deal with that quite comfortably. They're all in the template, yeah. No. It can't be. So it can't be both a public zone and a fire. No, it's either, it's either one or the other in Kobe. It has to have one outcome. So um, there's a classification for space, which is obviously unique to its individual space. And there's a classification for zone as well, which is obviously an accumulation of spaces. And under circulation, if we just go back a few slides, you can see under the circulation, there's actually not very many. There's only those. There's circulation zone, fire alarm zone, um, historical one, lighting, occupancy and ventilation, that's all you've got to pick from under the Uniclass code, so there's not actually that much option. So it would be defined as a zone um, under one of those categories. The spaces break it down a whole lot more, which is obviously unique to that space, which and then this, that, that table is not complete there, that scrolls down quite a bit for the... Uh, you you're creating those parameters from uh, get and you are making uh, uh, those ready for Probably 
all the data you've seen so far is, is ultimately design data. That data is required at, at stage two, so drop 2A or drop 2B, all this data is required for that drop. Um, because when we get to the Kobe tabs, um, they're the actually required field. So the yellow tabs that Anthony showed you earlier, they're required. So they're not something you can populate later. And, and it's not something you need to populate later because you already know the answers because we're drawing that space. And so we, we should know as, as the designers what that actually is. And so it's easy for us to just categorize it as we're going. Um, so we can utilize Revit's built-in classification system, or we, almost, because unfortunately, Revit's categorization system, which is built into the software, which is under the assembly code, under the type properties, what do you get when you hit that button? Well, unfortunately for us, we get everything American, because Revit doesn't cater for the UK market, has no classification system for the UK market whatsoever, it's all American Omniclass codes. So that's no good for us, and no good for Kobe. So how will we overcome this? Well, a lot of my time has been spe spent doing this, coding. So what am I coding? Coding the Uniclass codes. So what am I doing for that? I'm overriding the system files within the Revit templates. So if you dive into your C drive, you'll see that there's text files in Revit language. Um, and I sat and rewrote all the Uniclass tables, converted it into a text file in Revit language, and then replaced those text files so when you come into the Revit environment now, and you can see what, what, when we class, classify an item this time, and you come into the type properties, rather than getting the American Omniclass codes and having to go out of the Revit environment to an exhaustive pick list, which is huge, to try and find the correct Omniclass, um, sorry, Uniclass code, you can actually do this instead, which is go through the classification system in Revit and then specify the British Uniclass code, which is required. As so you can see, there they are highlighted now in, in Uniclass. So no longer is Revit reading the Omniclass American system. If you overwrite the text files in Revit, you can utilize the Uniclass for the UK. This, this project was run on the 1.4 system, so Uniclass 1.4. Two had, had not been released yet. It was still in early beta testing. So this is done on uh, Uniclass 1.4 tables. So this is why you probably won't recognize some of the codes. This, these are correct up to 1.4. We're actually doing the whole process now of writing the codes for two, which is much more extensive um, and a lot different to what we actually see in here. But it's the, it's the same, same methodology. You, you still have to specify the codes in the exact same way. Every single time the Uniclass updates, you would have to rewrite the text file. Um, however, two has now just been released. And even though the f the, they might add codes to that, I don't think they're going to change the format of it for quite a long time. Um, whereas 1.4 is a complete move away from what they're now doing, which falls in line with um, MBS Create and all the other things with the new building specification. New class two falls in with that. Was. We, we specify the information in Revit because, as Anthony said, we always want the model to hold all the data that actually publishes the Kobe sheet. We don't want a situation where we're adding manual data to the Kobe sheet that doesn't tie back to the model. That just doesn't make sense to us. Well, except, except that if the code just purely identifies, as long as you've got a schema between two codes, your information is still correct. So, can you, sorry, can you so ask me that question again? What we're doing is we're changing an Omniclass code to a Uniclass code. Correct. But the Omniclass code is, is an American code. But, but is there still an equivalent between them? It's an equivalent, it is an equivalent item, that's completely yeah. correct, but when you run the Kobe through the Kobe check at the end, it would be incorrect because the Kobe check at the end checks against the pick lists that are in the end, and the pick lists are all British Uniclass codes. So what I'm saying is you leave your Revit system file if they are in Omniclass when you produce your information from Revit. Yeah. You're not there. Do it, you could do it afterwards yeah, in something slightly sleeping. What I'm saying is you leave the system files in the software 
uh, in tap and result is like a little bit of liability against. I know exactly what you say. That, yeah, for instance, you could do it in something like Celebri where yeah. you could you could do it I right. Hopefully, the next couple of slides yeah. might show you. Um, so now we can see that in the assembly code and the and the assembly description, we've now got them in what we want, which is the elements classified under the Uniclass system. Just coming up the systems. Get to that slide in a second. And just coming up the systems. Unfortunately, Revit architecture has not got an easy way to assign elements to a system. Um, unless you're an m and &E engineer and you've got system tab, which we haven't as architects. And again, that's not ideal either because the systems tab in m and &E, uh, are not linked to the unit class tables either. So unfortunately, there's only one way to do this, and it's through a Revit schedule. Um, and again, there's a little bit of code in the background for this to be effective. So what we've done here is we've got a schedule and we've built some coding into the schedule, so it's given you some titles above each element, so it's given you some options of how to cl classify the system, and once you've used the right figure, it files it into the system you want, and there you go. So each item, using the coding we've put in the background, has filed it under a system name. And again, could this be done outside of route afterwards? Yes, probably. Um, but we feel it's really important to get everything classified in the Revit environment so everyone can link back to the model if and when required. So now it's time to export to IFC. IFC is the industry standard for exporting. Um, all, the, all the models are now complete. All the design data is in there. Um, so we export to IFC and we do this to federate the design in Celebri. Now we can start to see the benefits of all this design data when we come into the Celebri environment. So this is a Celebri model. Um, and we can set rule sets and classifications, which is what your point was. Uh, we can actually classify things outside of Revit if, if you want to. Um, but unfortunately, you wouldn't get the benefit of linking back to the Revit model and getting everything talking to one another. So you can easily navigate the models and isolate key elements and systems. So we're just going to go through the Celebri model here. And you can see now the systems that we've just shown you in Revit being specified can easily be broken down as soon as you click on any items in Celebri, they're all broken down into systems and elements, and you can easily navigate the model, and any facilities manager can easily navigate straight to the, the item that they're looking for, and every single item within that model contains every single piece of information about it. So we've got all the design data, and if we didn't do that, just coming back to your question, you wouldn't be able to get that breakdown of items you wouldn't be able to classify and see them in isolation like that. I suspect you're in a situation where effectively being one model author software has to provide it's more efficient to do it in package. I think in my environment where we have multiple software authors, it's much more efficient to do it in package and just take one and kind of say you can use that. Yeah. Reducing that is efficient or work. But if yeah, again, that's just what I think. But again though, when you come into the sleeping environment, if that's the case you wouldn't believe the difficulty of trying to get those items to talk to one another. They need to be classified before they get to Celebri, because otherwise it's just it's so, much, so difficult to tie them together because you have to write so many classification tables in Celebri, um, it would be too difficult to try and get the data collated. So this data is collated in Celebri quite easily just because I've already categorized all the items before I've even got there. For, for this project, we provided the yeah. we've, we've provided the template with all the same codes yeah. to work from. I know uh, White, Young, Green are in the room here, and they had all their own templates, and they're quite easy to use, well, weren't well, they? Part of, your plan, part, of your plan. part of the execution plan was to issue the templates um, and then just follow the same. We had a few workshops of how we were going to do this, yeah. and they just followed the same procedures as we did. So while I was getting back um, in Revit, was the same information. Well, well, consistency all come from the same parameter so that made my life so much easier when I got to Celebri to classify the items like this. So now we've got all the design data in Celebri and we've got it all talked to one and that's great um, but how do we get all the design data and manufacturing suppliers data as well this is where it all gets interesting because now we start to lose a little bit of control about how we're going to get that information back and would this be our, our job usually? No it's probably 
further down the line drop fours and fives as Anthony was talking about. But for this project, because it was a trailblazer and we decided we wanted to try and lead the construction industry and how it was going to be done, we, we decided that we were going to try and do the entire thing this time. And on such a small project, we thought we could try and facilitate this quite easily. So um, how did we do this? Um, we assigned elements to a work package in the authoring software, so Revit, so every single item that belonged to a certain supplier, I assigned it a work package. Um, and then that allowed me in Celebri, again, to filter by work package, create a Kobe sheet, which is why you can see at the bottom there. And then I sent the Kobe sheets off to each supplier, which is specific to their data only. So they didn't look at anybody else's data apart from their own. And so it was just quite a small sheet for them to look at with cells which are blank for them to fill out. So the information that he was talking about to do with um, who made it and what maintenance period it's got on it, the life expectancy of the product and all that kind of stuff. Um, the supplier then had to return the data to me via the, with the Kobe spreadsheet. Um, once I got those spreadsheets, well that's it isn't it because I've completed it now because I've got all the data back that I want from the supplier. Well actually no it's not because I want all that data back in the model because I don't want a disconnect between the model and the data. I want the model to be the thing that produces all the data. So why do we want that? Well, I want that because ultimately I want the model to be used for, to manage the facility. And again, this is another reason why I want all the data in the model because do I want the Kobe spreadsheet to be the end tool that everyone's using? Well, not really, we want it to be the model. We want the model to be used by the facility manager. We want that to be taken. We want it to be, sorry. Well, just that has to be either a personal plan or a client staff. So, I mean, well, that is, that is ultimately, what ultimately, I ultimately, I think that's the end game. Yes, I and I, I think. We're, we're coming from, yes, once we're, we're mandated to provide the code, yeah. we see better than to actually provide the model and having the intelligence yeah. then in it. The model in line with the code in line with the yeah. yeah. So you're describing the IR. Yeah. So, as long as everything is aligned, um, yeah. we. Then, then obviously the, the facilities manager can manipulate them all. Does that happen at the minute? No, it doesn't. But ultimately, that's what we want to happen, and it does give them the option to, to be able to do that. And but we're not actually being asked for that at this specific time, but we think it'll come in the very near future where, whereby that's what they want. And actually, there's this software beyond this, which is probably a separate presentation again, where you can actually set um, rule sets against elements to ring alarms when maintenance is required and all sorts of things. Okay. Asset tagging, you can actually use a barcode scan at the scan to a particular item in the model which switches straight to the item. And it's, it's, it's quite a good piece of software to look at, um, which we see that as facilities management of the future. And hopefully this is the start of what will be required to get there. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, in the Kobe spreadsheet at the moment, what does it actually do? Well, at the moment, it, all it actually does is it's a, a sort of a dumb way to talk to all the varying different types of six management software to get data from the spreadsheet into their FM systems. And it's the only way we can universally talk to all those systems. And so ultimately, at the moment, the facilities managers are still doing it in the same way as they always have done, but with the benefit of using a Kobe spreadsheet to get it there. So when you Yeah. He then fills in that, those specific cells in that Excel sheet which you have required from him and nothing else. And he fills those cells in manually. They are manually input, yes. Um, obviously, it depends on um, how clued up the supplier or manufacturer is or whether they've. Obviously, when I had this conversation with some of them, they had no idea what I was talking about when I first lifted that phone, phone up to them and say, oh, we need Kobe data. They don't need to as long as they're, they're, you're asking, yeah. asking them that specific question. You fill in that yeah, box. so they might have had four lines, for instance, four lines of Kobe data, which had all the design data in it. The rest of the cells were empty. They're pretty self-explanatory, but what I actually sent out with that as well was another spreadsheet which explained exactly what needed to go in the empty cells and give them a pick list for each one. So hopefully it was quite simple for them to fill out. And it actually only took most of them only two goes to get it back with a complete set of data so it wasn't that difficult so once i've got that data what do i do with it well because i want it all back in the model i'm back to my ctc plugin and on the last tab there the excel link you can see that i can actually map 
the Excel spreadsheet which they've given me back, back into my Revit model by mapping the exact parameters from Excel to Revit. And as soon as I do that, um, just by exporting it, just by clicking the button, it all comes back in and my um, sheet is then populated in my Revit environment with all the manufacturer's data. And that would be everything we need to complete the actual spreadsheet. So what do I do again then? Back to IFC, it's a big vicious circle unfortunately. You might have to go through this process a number of times. So if the data wasn't quite right, it's a case of going back round and doing it over and over until you get all the data correct. So in Salibri, this, this is what we ultimately want. Um, we've got all the data now, and so we can actually come into the Salibri environment. And by running a Kobe check, it'll validate all the data in our model. But it's not case, just a case of filling out the entire model and saying that's it. Unfortunately, there are, there are required fields. It has to be um, populated with fields that are relevant to the Kobe sheet. So this is just showing you how we populated the Kobe sheet. And you can see then that as soon as it's done that, I've still got access to all the elements. I can just click on any of them, and it'll zoom straight to that and give me all the information for that. So I know that there is a validated, completed Kobe sheet. If it wasn't, it would come up and give me a load of errors saying that it didn't comply with the Kobe standard or the requirement because it checks against the pick lists that are on the end. And so I know that that's a validated Kobe sheet. So what do I do with that then? Well, there's my Kobe sheet. It should give me a preview of it. We literally hit the report button and that will send it straight to Excel. And this is what we get. This is obviously not all the sheet. This is um, just a quick preview of each sheet that Anthony's already explained. And you can see how it's fully populated. Here's the zones we were talking about earlier. So it's actually categorizing every room into a zone. And that's what that long list is there of all the rooms in the zone. Um, and again, you can use Celebri to click on any of these items and actually highlight any of these things. It's the component sheet, system sheet, assembly sheet, document sheet, the attribute sheet, all completely filled out by Celebri. Most of them are done automatically. Um, for instance, the attribute sheet is done automatically, and this one, the coordinate sheet, is done automatically. This is something that you just can't do at a Revit. This is given the exact coordinates of every single element in the project, and Celebri will just do that for you, so it'll pick up every item, and it'll just give you the correct northings and eastings for each item. And that is how you deliver a Kobe sheet, so thank you very much for listening. Hopefully that was intuitive for, for most of you. Um, one, two, technical, I hope. It's We've just given you a quick overview there and not really got into any of the nitty gritty of it, but hopefully it's given you a good. Sorry, you know, once you generate the parameters from CTC, yeah. are you generating it for every component in the model? The CTC will generate a Kobe parameter for every single element in the entire model. Um, so, I mean, you can't really, you can't really produce a Kobe sheet without that, that plugin. There was an Autodesk plugin for 2013, um, which was okay, I believe, but what it didn't do was map parameters back from an external source like Excel back into Revit. Um, I believe it was a bit buggy with populating parameters as well. And I also believe that it hasn't been re-released for 2014 yet, so there is not another option in 2014 other than using the CTC plugin. It's all for using it at the moment, the 2013 plugin. There isn't a 2014 version, so yeah, CTC yeah. is the only thing available to actually populate code parameters at the minute. Yeah, that's, um, basically, CTC, so it's not, so. my, my understanding is the opposite Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But with, 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 with CTC, there's a few strings to its bow, and there's, yeah. there's a few more tabs to it. But unfortunately, again, it's, a, it's an American product. Again, it's all American code in it. Yeah. So you still have to have all the workarounds, which I just showed you, um, to generate the uniclass code, which you need for compliance with our Kobe standards. What do they use at Australia? On the Royal Adelaide Hospital, we're obviously producing Kobe sheets, but it, they do use the American standards. Uh, okay. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, probably not, because um, because 
Unfortunately, as long, we, we think we're a big player in the market, but the UK actually are quite small in terms of how much it would cost them to develop that. Maybe I'll sell it to them, I don't know. Yeah, we kind of, yeah, we kind of make up our own thing anyway, so yeah, we can't, we'll yeah. Um, Uniclass 2 is actually a little bit more difficult in terms of systems because the Uniclass 2 codes, I don't know whether he's actually seen that book yet, but it's literally 397 pages of codes. So unfortunately, the Uniclass 2 coding for systems in particular is much more difficult. So again, I've come up with another way of, of doing that, which is not in this presentation because we never had to do it for that. But yeah. for systems, yeah. Um, so for systems, for instance, that the the assembly code which I showed you in in Revit, all we've essentially done for that is create another parameter called system name, and we've searched for the system name using uh, the the assembly code parameter, which gives you that nice tree to find things really quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as long as you do the systems first, you can copy and paste from that cell down to the bottom one, and that's giving you the system name, and then you can search for the element name through the same system. So I've actually put two uniclass tables into the same, into the same assembly code. How many systems can It's not that they're designed to read Kobe, it's if they're designed to take the data from the Kobe sheet and populate the facilities management system. So the example we were given by a facilities management contractor was that actually in the old way of doing it, when they got given the O&M manuals and they had to go and find all this information and they had to try and collate from all these maintenance documents, it took them about eight months to populate the facilities management system and actually with the Kobe spreadsheet it took them three weeks. So that's where they were going with it. So it's, it's, it's more of a tool to get the information from uh, the Excel sheet in a pretty dumb way which is copy and paste into the facilities management system. And, and obviously if they're a bit more clued up with Excel and they can write their own categories and a, a bit, more, bit more coding, perhaps it could map things and concatenate data straight across into the facilities management system so it would make things a lot easier. But that's how we, we've, we see it just as, it's, it's just a go-between because it's, we can accommodate all these different facilities management softwares. We can only accommodate one thing, which is the Kobe sheet, because it's the industry standard. It's something that people will be familiar with and they understand and they're used to seeing. And so they can just use that, know where to look for it, and populate <coughs> what information. They, as, as Anthony said, they will not want all the information. They might want column one, five, and seven. They can take one, five, and seven. That's fine. Do you think um, it looks like the CapEx Well, my, my first impression was that it would, it, would, it would fall by the wayside, but me and Anthony attend quite a lot of conferences in, in, in sort of London with Building Smart and all these guys that are, which are pushing the industry in this direction. It's got absolutely no signs that it's going to go. In fact, it's actually gathering pace and, and more people are, are using it and more pieces of software are trying to incorporate Kobe now. In, in my opinion, as I've said before, I think actually the Kobe sheet will fall by the wayside. The sheet will, but the Kobe data, the Kobe data is yeah. invaluable, and that will stay. But I think what will happen eventually is the model will be where the information is sourced, and not the Kobe sheet. Personally, if I was a facilities manager, I'd much rather sit in front of a model and navigate to the item, click on it, and give me everything about it, rather than going through a a massive Kobe sheet or b an O and M manual. Yeah, because the, the software I spoke about earlier about incorporating <coughs> all this into a facilities management tool. Not only does it allow you to set maintenance alarms and let you manage the, the facility, <coughs> it also allows you to attach documentation to any element. Yeah. So you can attach. Hyperlinked. It's not hyperlinked. It's um, literally attached. Yeah. So if you click on it, it just comes up literally by the side of it. It's got a drawing. It's got a th uh, the own M manual. All, all <laughs> it's all database driven, yeah. yeah. So the software I'm talking about there is Veil. So if you've ever seen okay. it. Actually, yeah. So in your position, which you see it. <coughs> To be, to be fair, that's not really my area of expertise or ours because we don't get involved in that too much. I know that we're working with a client here at the moment 
We're using Archibus, is that correct? Um, but it's entirely up to you. You can use anything you want. We're not going to drive what we think is the best software because, to be, to be fair, we wouldn't have a clue. Uh, and it's and it's down to each client's personal, personal preference. I mean, there might be softwares out there that do things in a better way for your company than it does for another company. So we're not going to drive which software we and we no, we're not here to sell software. We're just obviously talking about the software which we use to do this, which we find useful for our output. To be honest, I think on, on the um, projects that have been trialled at the moment, they are still using the uh, trade and testing yeah, yeah, yeah. facility management, and they are looking at what they can use moving forward in various markets. So, as Dean said, we're not really on yeah. that sort of side of the, um, the team anymore, but we are on the most of people on different parts of us. Yeah. I mean, a lot of facilities managers anyway have already got their system and they're not going to invest in something else. It's far too expensive. Um, and also their users are so familiar with using any piece of software, they're not going to change. It's like our company, we use Revit. We could not even dream about using anything else. We're too big to, to swap to something else and, and retrain the entire, the entire workforce. I, you were saying that um, you use the code day <coughs> Yeah. and facilities management systems. If you, like, later down the line, you have um, modifications to that building that you want in your BIM model, would you effectively have to sort of code the back out of your uh, facilities management software to then keep the model up to date? Well, this is an interesting conversation we've had, and, and it depends whether the, the end user would, would want that. I mean, in an ideal world, I guess they would. So as a design team, I guess it's something that would, would help us with a bit of a repeat business, that it would, it would actually be better if you came back to us and say, look, we're swapping this room, we're moving this wall, we're putting another extract fan in, can you add this to your, to your model? Um, could you update the Kobe data and could you put it back out again? And we could do that, um, not at any stage, It's not because we're always going to have this, this data available to us and the model available to us. And I guess it could be done by the facilities manager or, or, or the, the client if they had the skills in-house to, to use a Revit model and, and, and update it themselves. Yeah, and it doesn't always happen. And we know for a fact that it doesn't happen. We, you know, it, 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 they might update, or put a CAD draw in, move a, CAD, move a wall and put a new door in, but then the model gets left behind. And then over the course of 10 years, it gets further and further out of date and it never catches up. But I think that's just because at the moment nobody uses a model. But ultimately, if they are using the model, then I think they'll see the benefit in actually keeping that model constantly up to date. And I think they'll see the benefits of, of using the model rather than using sheets of paper. Just been released, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so Pass 11, uh, uh, 92, 3 is, is literally all aimed at facilities management and asset management. Um, and it's literally so new, I haven't actually read it all yet. I've read the, 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 the pre-release, as it were, but not, not the end thing. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's lots of stuff in there which, which show the, uh, the mapping of how things should be updated. And interestingly, what does that actually show? Does it show that you should come back through the design team to update the data and come back? Or? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, it's always going to be a difficult thing to do, isn't it? Um, and it ultimately comes down to control, I guess, and the level of control that the person who's managing that facility has and, and how obviously key in they are to keep the model updated. I mean, for certain facilities, take it at a hospital, for instance, like I was working on, it was absolutely fundamental that the model was kept up to date and it had all the latest information. 
because you know for certain pieces of equipment obviously people's lives are on the line as well so that that data was crucial and certainly in terms of maintenance and all that kind of stuff so, so Well, the, co the Kobe sheet, the, the correct way of actually doing this is it gets passed along the entire design team and then through the contractor, through the facilities manager, and every, everyone owns it, but they own it at a different stage of the project. This was a slightly different scenario where we decided we were going to do the whole lot because nobody really knew how to do it anyway. But ultimately, it would, be, it would be owned by lots of different people and can be passed back and forth. And so... If it was ultimately the design team were responsible for updating it, we'd have to obviously have an, an, an agreement in place where if something was updated, we could go in, carry out a survey or, or do whatever we needed to do to update the model, update the Kobe data, push it all back through again, and you'd have a new, brand new sheet with the updated data in. Steve, can I uh, add yeah. to that? Yeah. It's, in terms of responsibility, model updates will always be the information manager to start up in the uh, second appendix to be a so actually, as the employer, you, uh, throughout the, the life cycle of the asset, you, you're responsible for design and information management. And that can be different, different parties, different points along. And, and, every, and every single yeah, design team can have an information manager. You, you, you are, as the employer, within the CIT protocol, responsible for design. Yeah. And that can be an internal party, it can be an external party. Yeah. Uh, usually, you know, within design, it sits well, but the, the sort of head of design team, the construction, the main contractor. Obviously, post completion in terms of management can be you know, a separate party from your operation maintenance contract, but they aren't actually you know, necessarily geared up to doing that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's remembering that the CRC doing protocols is alongside the past option, but actually, in terms of contractual responsibility, that's where the contractual responsibility is. Yeah, well, the CIC BIM protocol should also be included in every bin and execution plan, which just forms part of the contract. Yeah, well, well not quite how it's sitting in the document. So you've got the, the CIC BIM protocol is your contract document that sits in the tender. The BIM execution plan responds to the ER documents. So it will be referenced to... But it's also referenced to it, yeah. It will be referenced to the, the BIM execution plan in direct response to the employee's information requirements. They'll be in the ADAS document. It is, and it, but at the back of that, at the back of that appendix, there's actually sheets for you to fill out which form part of the contract also in the CIC BIM protocol. Yeah. Um, any questions? I'd never come across any elements that didn't have a uni class. So there was a uni-class code fair. Is that, sorry, was that your yeah, question? Yeah, because obviously the previous release, they had it, and we were talking about a huge number. That There's had. a huge number. Yeah, so There's, there's stuff in there which you've probably never even heard of before. I certainly haven't. So there must have been some that had been created in the previous release. It was, it was more broad, though. In, in, in yeah, the, yeah, it's, it's yeah, yeah, but... It actually takes those classes and actually subdivides them into more classes. That's what they've added. It's, it's a granulation of data rather than adding additional coverage. It is, it is that, and actually the old, the old system was actually a lot easier to use than the Uniclass 2 system. And ironically as well, the Omniclass system, the American Omniclass system, is 10 times easier to use than our system. It makes perfect sense, whereas ours is much, much harder to classify. There is, um, unfortunately with Uniclass, it does come down to the user specifying its actual element properties. Um, and there is an argument that it could be a few things. So not necessarily if it's done by two different people would you get the same answer. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the wrong answer. It just means it's their answer. It's the best way of putting it. Yeah. No, because only because before it went out um, we sent basically an appendix saying that this sheet, this column, these are the answers. This sheet, this column, these are the answers, which took quite a long time. So it was literally checking a list and putting an answer in the box. And the other things that didn't have a pick list answer were, were, were ov obvious things, like things that only they would know anyway. What's the serial number? What's the lifespan of the, of the, of the element? Things that they would have the answer for. 
And the other things, I don't know whether you, how much you've looked into the Kobe sheets, but things like colour, shape, all that kind of thing, they're, they're, they're given answers, you know, they, they can't be anything else. So a lot of their things, even though this is quite extensive, can only be an, one answer. I think because this project wasn't very large and it, it wasn't that extensive, <coughs> we didn't get any, anybody saying, mm, we don't really want to do this. But I'm, I'm guessing that, that could definitely be the case um, had, had they known beforehand. If they didn't know beforehand and then all of a sudden they, this Kobe sheet landed on their desk and they had a thousand items, I think they might be pretty upset. It's about setting the requirements at the, at the very outset, no matter what your requirements are. Soft landings, Kobe, meet no. Because if suddenly the supply chain are asked to produce documentation that didn't think it was part of their order, why would they? Yeah, um, I think this is a difficulty of the industry at the moment because clients don't really know what they want. We're sort of having to explain what they could get. Yeah. Um, and that always comes after appointments of both yeah. of the main parties. I, t I don't disagree, but I think ultimately we, we are learning still. You know, as a client, you may not know exactly what you want tomorrow. At least you might know what you want today, and then obviously you can approach that situation later on as and when it needs change. And that's obviously what we've talked about, is how we, how we, how we maintain and manage those changes. So I'm guessing as long as you know beforehand that you've got to produce a Kobe output and you're part of the supply chain and you know that, then there's no surprises, I guess. But unfortunately on this project, it was a bit of a surprise because it's the day when you heard about it when I picked up the phone which wasn't ideal, especially when you're trying to explain what a Kobe sheet is over the phone. Um, but yeah, um, to be fair, we, none of them said anything about it. They all facilitated it really well, and we were really, really pleased with the, the results we had back. Um, some of the feedback we did get, however, was they were reluctant to fill out expected life, I think was one of the things they were very reluctant to fill out because obviously all their items were saying, well, how long's a piece of string? It depends. They can use it six times a day. They're going to use it once every six months. You tell you know you tell me, and I'll tell you how long it's going to last. And it's that kind of question which we had back consistently. Um, but the answer to that is 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 this is just generally we have to say what is the expected life of the product under typical use. But unfortunately, just because they were so worried about this being um, contractual and obligated, that they worried to fill out, but it's actually not the case. This is not a contractual document at all. Um, if they put in the six months, it lasts three, they couldn't go back to the supplier and say, oh, you said it's going to last six months, and it lasts to three, that's not the case. But it should have been an expected life of, of a typical output. But that was one of the fields that they, they did, did reluctantly fill out. Any more questions? Yeah. So in the, in the presentation, so I skipped through it quite quick, um, when I got that valid, the Excel spreadsheet back, I used CTC to push it back into the Revit model. The Revit model goes out to IFC to Celebri, and Celebri has got rules. So the rule sets, once you've run the rule sets, it comes back and says, you've got mistakes in these rows, you've got mistakes in these lines. So Celebri does the classification and the rule set check-in, and that will tell you exactly whether there's any errors in the spreadsheet. Um, there's plenty of tools out there which will tell you if the spreadsheet's all filled out. Well, we, open, we can see that in Excel, that's no good to us. So Libri tells us whether it's right or wrong. It does, um, and the design, I didn't probably go, go over it in great detail, but the, the Kobe, um, sorry, the design review part of the software, the, when we issued out that Kobe sheet, what I should have said as well is we also issued a model, and that was sent out so the, the supplier and manufacturer could look at the model in design review, and because in the Kobe sheet, into the design data, everything's got a unique identifier, they can push that six-digit code into the design review, which would take them to that exact item, so they knew exactly what item they were looking at in the model, so they could specify the data for that exact item. And it's a good question, actually, because the examples could be that there could be two components which are exactly the same, but they could be something as simple as the colour was different. Yeah. 
So they'd have to know which one was where. And by using the design review model, which some of them struggled with a little bit, I have to confess, they built a zoom straight to that item within design review, like I can do in Celebri, but Celebri is a lot more complex for them to use. So it's a free tool, which is downloadable for, as a free viewer and very simple to use so that they could actually manipulate our model, which we sent to them, to find their items. There is that element to it, yeah. But um, uh, so on, on this project, we were kind of lucky as well that um, two of the, the major suppliers were also the manufacturers and the design team. As well, I think you've got to look at uh, Kobe looking at doing some maintainable assets, so things like mechanical fans and light fittings and things like that. Door handles, yes, <coughs> but perhaps less sophisticated sort of research. Oh, just a, a small I appreciate that, but obviously, what I'm trying to say is obviously <coughs> the mechanical elements, fans and things, would obviously be the sort of thing that we were pushing back and forth between the designers and the suppliers to make sure that the right one was probably with the right serial number, etc. Um, but it is a good question, and, and as, the, as the process grows, I think more and more people will be understanding that and actually producing their own levels of information. How do you see COVID compliance sitting with the current fee structure? Well, how do you see Kobe compliance sitting with the current fee structure? Over to you. <laughs> well, Good for to talk about. Well, we, had a we actually had a separate fee for this. So Kobe was a completely separate fee altogether. Because what, what, what I would say on that, what we, what we did with the main contractor, we all went into the process of design understanding what the requirements were, and we all presumably gave a fee that was relative to that scope of service. When the main contractor realised that they perhaps didn't have the necessary skill sets and skill bases to be able to move into the drop four, um, it was a decision that we, as a group of instructors, talked about at length to say, actually, did we really want to be doing this? Because as architects, that's what we are, or as engineers, that's what we are. But aren't, aren't you necessarily bin managers to practice who want to be popping that level of data from suppliers who you have no uh, relationship with other than you have with them in the project? But we actually saw the benefit doing that, and like Dean said, we actually negotiated the fee to, be, to take over that bid management and have that data exchange. Um, however, I think from, from core design responsibilities, we would be sort of mindful about where we go in the future as a business, um, because actually I do think it is a market that needs to be supplied by the supply chain. Yeah, just, just to add that to that as well, obviously with this project we went far and beyond what a design team would be asked to produce. Um, and for a BIM level 2 requirement, we're only required to produce design data. And actually, if you're producing a BIM level 2 project, the design data is there as a given. You should be specifying the uniclass of each item, its zone uniclass, which system it sits in, etc., as a default. So therefore, the Kobe 2 drop should be a given. It should be just happen automatically, because that data should be there at a BIM level 2 project.